right. Well, good afternoon. My name is Lauren Walker, and I'm the CEO of Mantis EDU. And today I wanted to really spend some time showing you some ways in which you can bring computer science to your classroom via a turnkey learning management system that we work with. Before doing that, I wanted to give you a sense of who you're speaking with and my background. And so I'll, I'll start with that. Um, so I'm Lairam, I'm Atlanta native. I matriculated to Atlanta Public Schools and have a bachelor's and a master's in electrical and computer engineering. Undergraduate was at Tennessee State University and graduate school was at Purdue University. Um, and I spent a lot of time focusing on doing um, computer science and coding in both research and in industry. And I realized from my background that coding um, really changed my, my, my path and really sparked me figuring out what my why was and allows me to do the things that I really care about. So I'm very excited about this space. Um, realizing though that a lot of the things that I learned in industry and through my businesses are not really exposed to our kids in classrooms just due to how clunky and how cumbersome or in some cases how complicated it is to kind of teach computer science. So in doing that, um, I started a company called Mantis CDU. And with Mantis CDU, we focus on allowing for kids to get access to real world skills through hands-on learning. Mm -hmm. And a big part of that is focused on computer science and how you leverage that and expose kid to, kids to that. Um, so typically we do things like the slide in front of you where we'll take whether it's computer science examples or whether it's hands-on sensors and coding tools, and we provide end-to-end -end solutions that allow for students and learners to really experience computer science in practice so it's not just theory. And a lot of that, we spent the last five or six years thinking about how we could bring this into after school programs and classrooms to make it fun and engaging for everybody that's there. And so today I wanted to focus on a few things that we're doing to show you how you can do the same in your classroom. So in most cases, um, if you're teaching computer science, you probably have leveraged um, some of the common tools that are out there. And so there are tools like Scratch, which is very popular in the elementary ranks. Um, some people now are starting to use tools like Microsoft Make Code to kind of teach block programming. But oftentimes what happens is that you have these tools, you're going to websites, it's not integrated with your learning management system, or you're finding ways to find examples offline, or you're trying to submit the example to grade it, and it creates a very cumbersome conversation. And so what we've done is we found a way to pull all those things together in a way that um, allows you to do things that you're very familiar with. And so for today's topic of conversation, I'm gonna focus on a tool um, called Codeo. And Codeo is one of our partners that we work very strongly with and we represent and use the solution in K-12. But think of Codeo as being a learning management system that allows for you to teach um, computer science in a very easy and intuitive way. Um, what's nice about it is that it's akin to having a Google Classroom or a Blackboard um, with an extreme focus um, on being tailored around computer science. And what's nice about it is that this platform um, supports almost every popular language imaginable. But more importantly, it's all done in the browser. And so whether your kid is on a Chromebook or your kid has a, a PC or a Mac, uh, in some cases that they really chose to, we've had kids in the summertime use iPads to kind of do some of these computer science ex experiments or uh, opportunities. And so that's really cool to see. But from a teacher perspective, what's nice about it is that one, no matter what curriculum or language your school has settled on, you can use this platform for doing that. And today I'll get some examples and show uh, of the tool being leveraged across a number of different um, coding languages. But more importantly, again, it's all online. It allows you to, it has a huge library of content you can pull from, like starter packs that you can customize. Within the platform, you can author courses or you can take and share courses. So if that was like a master teacher in your school organization who built a course, that course can be shared across others um, inside of the organization, school and or district. Once you provide a, um, a course or access to a student within the platform, you can also do things such as auto grading. You could go and look for things like um, plagiarism. So if a kid submitted an assignment and it was similar to another kid's, you could check for those things. There's a notion of um, logging in. So let's say that was a teacher and you're teaching remotely, you can log in and kind of see where a student is in, inside of the process. And more importantly, you integrate with all the various tools that are out there. So whether it's platforms like GitHub where you're sharing code, all these things are done in a customizable way that's scalable and ready for you to use. So in giving that, um, let's switch over and I wanna move to a live demo and show the platform. And so um, I'm going over here now. So I'm logged in now and I will go into the Codeo platform to kind of show you how it works. 
So to log into Codeo and get into the platform, I'm logged in now as a master teacher in this platform. And what's nice about the platform is that, as you can see, since I use this quite a bit, there are a number of different courses inside of the platform that are there. Now, inside of each course, and I'll pick an example of a course that has students in it, I'll take this Internet Python course that we taught last summer. And let's go through a few things that's nice about this. So notice within this course, I have my lessons laid out. I can show which students are assigned to the course. So every student that is assigned to this course is here. And within the platform, I can not only see what assignments they've completed, if they got them right or wrong, but I could literally jump in and change their password. I can remove them, archive them, and activate on, and work on their behalf. As a teacher, I can go inside of these modules. So in this case, this is a module that has um, is teaching about loops and variables. So if I were to click on this, I could literally take and modify this content and build out content. And so just like you would log into, a, again, a Google Classroom or any tool you're familiar with, you can literally build out the entire course to support what you're doing. What's nice about it as well is that within the core of your platform, I click on resources. These are pre-vetted and pre um completed uh, full courses and assessments that support almost every um, example you can think about, right? So if you're a student teacher looking to teach Python, you can filter by Python and find Python courses. So if I were to go, for instance, to this Python course detail, again, it shows you the full course, what it teaches, what assessments are there, what basic modules are taught. And more importantly, if you wanna add this into your, into your course, you just simply add it and add it to your catalog. And that'll become a part of your Codeo instance that you can customize and offer to your students in classrooms. Now, what's nice about the platform as well is that if you think about how computer science works um, or coding works, oftentimes, depending upon what you're teaching, whether you're teaching, let's say, JavaScript or Java or C++ or you name a language, oftentimes, um, you have to worry about does the, does the machine support the work that you're doing? So Codeo and supports major stacks. So without getting too technical, Every um, course is offered on the Ubuntu virtual machine. And on that virtual machine, you can install any operating stack that you want. So whether you want C++ or Python, you name it. And you can build these starter packs that are supported and already built out. So again, if you're teaching Angular or WordPress, whatever it may be. And what's nice about this is that once you build this starter pack and you add your course on top of the starter pack, every student um, who gets access or takes this course, they get their own virtual machine provision that's solely for the purpose of them working on this project. And so if you had a class of one student or a class of a thousand students, they all would have their individual environment that's pre-configured with all the software that installed without you having to worry about if things are gonna work or if there's an issue or concern around them not having a certain operating system or a certain patch or a certain browser. So it makes it really interesting to kind of get things going. So given that, let's walk into a few examples. And so what I did was I pulled up a few different courses in the, in the platform, and I wanna start with basic languages. So oftentimes if you're, um, Scratch is a very popular language that a lot of us like to use for early learners. Um, you know, we've seen kids as young as kindergarten using the platform, but oftentimes maybe second to third grade and beyond is where Scratch kind of starts. And the most, um, in most use cases when leveraging Scratch, students um, we typically go to the scratch website and we'll have a kid do an example or complete an example maybe download the file and submit it to a teacher so it's a very kind of asynchronous process that's hard to kind of really put into a framework and so in this case we have a course it's an intro to programming with scratch course and you can notice that this course we built out a bunch of different modules and so this particular course was built um, to target some up elementary middle school kids with the idea of introducing them to the, to the coding platform and what it could do, some basic ideas. And the idea was that they end it, in this case, with plotting data and integrating with one of the, the Mantis environmental sensors. So it was an end-to-end -end use case. So let me show you, um, it, as a student, how this will work in Codeo. So what I will do is I will preview um, the beginning of this course and kind of show you and walk through some of the interface and how Codeo makes life easy to a teacher. So imagine now, a uh, student gets access to the platform and now they're logged into here. So it's a very guided experience. And so in this, for this particular course, and you have complete control over the environment, 
we started out with doing some introductory modules to kind of introduce, since this was a virtual course, we introduced the instructor, we gave some basic information about Scratch and how it works, and we got them involved with the Codeo um, environment. It kind of, so it wasn't so much of a, um, you know, jumping into something that you hadn't, hadn't been exposed to before. So a student can watch these videos and they can mark it as complete. So if they marked as complete, remember earlier I showed you kind of a student's progress as they would navigate into a course, that would trigger that particular thing happening. So assume I, I watch these videos and I'm done with that. So I go back to my dashboard. So I would have finished module one in that case. But let's get into something more interesting, like an actual program and example. So if you've ever taught Scratch before, again, think about your previous example and how you've had to do that. In this case, the Scratch environment actually loads directly within Codeo. So notice what's happening here. Not only am I given instruction on the left side of the screen on things to do, right? So I'm guiding them through some examples. So in this case, it's telling me what to do. But more importantly, a student can actually go and build out full examples on the right side and run it in real time without having to leave the browser. So the full Scratch environment is included directly inside of the browser. And that's very powerful because on the left side now, I can build out very specific instructions to allow for the kid to do things and they can walk through a guided experience. So in this case, notice that as I go through every particular script, even though I'm changing and going through a lesson, the right side doesn't change. So I can iteratively walk a kid through an example, have them go test the example, submit the example, and when they're done, I can hit grade. And what's nice about this is that when they save the file here, this is all stored in the learning management system without having to leave the system. And for those of you who've ever interacted or worked with Scratch in the past, you would realize that you know this is a really interesting uh, time saving uh, because it gives you a lot of a lot of interesting things that you can you can have happen. And when the student finishes, I can exit out of the platform and just go back to the dashboard. So again, without having to have a computer or install any software, I just went through and I could teach an entire Scratch example and go through it. And so in this case, we I'll show other examples where we have a module one conditionals, uh, where again, we've gone through, we built the lesson, we customize it, it's here and ready to go. And when those students come through to log the platform, just like before, those lessons come in and it walks you through what a condition is and how it works. So imagine this course being created, targeted. Teacher A likes, you know, they like the fact that, for instance, if I go back to the dashboard, maybe you have built this lesson out and it's too much content for your after school program or for your in class program. So what would happen is you, this master course is published in the platform. So you can literally come in and if you were a teacher, you could clone this course. And you can only take the first module, the third module, the second module. You could go through and change the content out and make it your own without having to worry about who's there and what they're doing with it. And so that's an example of um, using Scratch. And again, in this particular course, to show you if a, if, a student, if a student was having issues, as an administrator, I could simply go to the Students tab and I can say log in as the student. And by doing that, the platform now is logging into Codeo as a student. And this is the this is all they would see. So instead of them seeing all the other features that I showed you before, notice that this student can come in. They know they're taking this particular course. They can see they've been working on progress one, two, three, or four, and they can guide through the example and complete it. And within the system, you can also control like if module one must be completed before module two is done. All those things are completely controlled and leveraged by you. And so you can tell the student go submit this homework assignment, complete this without really having to do a lot of management opportunities there. So again, think about that, how easy that was, and I use Scratch. Now, beyond Scratch, let's think about what else you would teach. So oftentimes you start with Scratch, and Scratch is a really cool language for teaching kind of concepts. Oftentimes focus on cause and effect, um, also focusing on control and flow. And so the next thing that people often like to teach, um, people like to show examples of, of flow charting. So floor chart is the next logical example before you get into some of the more physical um, languages that exist. And so within Codeo, there's another, um, again, tool that's built inside of it called Float. And Float is very interesting in that it's a visual flowchart builder that allows for you to have interactive um, connections and 
um, you can basically build flowcharts and debug them in real time and see them working within the web browser while also introducing kids to the different shapes and things that exist. So again, in this particular course, I will skip forward to a good example I saw, this, um, this string expressions example. So let's go here and open up the, um, the float example. And so again, flow charting is typically about learning about cause, effect, the different shapes and what they mean. And so what's nice about it in this case is let's jump into it. And again, introductory video explaining how flow works. But let's get down to the meat and potatoes. This particular example wants to show you how strings work. OK. And again, just like in a scratch example, in this case, we put the flow uh, flow chart on the left side and on the right side, we put the examples. And so, again, kid comes through. And one of the nice things about Codio is this. So it's giving me expressions and examples. I have a flow chart here and we can do one or two things. So this particular code opens. You have a string called hello and then you add world to it and you want to print out the new string. And so let's run this and see what happens. So notice how in the web browser with a flowchart, I'm literally now looking at the output being printed to the bottom and it's all real time. So that was running straight through. It also has a nice debug feature. So I can hit this debug option and I can step through the program iteratively and watch the output. So I started out, I have two strings with nothing inside of it. I'm gonna set my string to hello. So when I hit next, notice hello was added. My new string now equals hello, which is string one plus world. And I want to print that out. That's there. And now I print out a new string and you see the output is hello world. And what's interesting about this is that in real time, if I wanted to come in and add a new block in here, like add another block or something inside of here, all of this is changeable directly in real time. Um, oops, I'm sorry. I can change this all in real time. I can add blocks. I can delete blocks. I can change the text from hello to hello to and anything that I do in this program, it all happens and changes in real time. And that's that's very popular and, and very, very um, interesting for doing that. And so um, another example, I got strings, I have numbers. So let's do it again. Let's step through it first. So if I run through and step through it, number was set to my string, a numerical value was set. I added a string and a number together and I did a new, and I added a new string. So gone are the days of having to have flow charts on paper with, you know, as I learned back when I was in school, having to have my stencil and trying to draw what different shapes are, understanding what a decision matrix is or a conditional matrix or a branch. All of this can be done in real time. And also you can hit the export button and that will export a copy of that flowchart to be used or submitted as an example. So now you notice I have a full copy of that of my work that I have access to. So this gives you a lot of flexibility. So when you're trying to get, you know, kids excited, understanding how basic flow is working, you can run through it and make it happen. Now, this is another cool example. So notice I have a blank flow chart. I have an example that I want to build. The solution is to build a output block that has, um, what does it say here? I want all, um, I want a case sensitive lowercase that says hello world and I want to check it. So notice if I hit the check it button, it's checking to see that it didn't work. And so you can have real time checks happening. So let's try to build this out. So it said bring over a hello world decision, um, make it, um, it says, Hello world. Let's try that and put a string in here. And then I'll bring down a decision block. I'll tie these together. And let's run this and see what it does. Oops, put that here. I'll run that. And that says hello world. And let's go and check it and see. The output is hello world instead of hello world. So notice how it's giving me real time feedback. So now let me go try to correct that. Hello. I'll make this world. I can check my answer by running it. It looks like it's correct. Can I check it? And bam, it's done literally in real time. So you can imagine being able to go and build out a bunch of iterative examples that can be stepped to step through um, without literally having to have a person involved in the conversation. 
again, very powerful tool for teaching in an interactive way. And you can imagine as you build out your library of questions and examples over time, um, it allows you to really teach these things without having to repeat and start over. Um, and so as you go from semester one or semester two, you can make it happen. And more importantly, one of the things that we've done in the past is if you have particular students that have different um, levels of um, experience. So maybe a particular kid has already had a program in language before you could build challenges that go deeper or further. And so the level of um, rigor that's used can be basically the, you can change it around based on the, the kid's skill set. So, again, I've shown you scratch. So a kid has left scratch and they've done drop and drag programming. They've gotten excited about it. They've learned about conditions and blocks and branching, but they still don't know much about regular code yet. And now you're trying to bridge over to a kid who is starting a student who is starting to learn about coding. And so before you get into textual languages and compiling and code, you want to focus on getting them excited with blocks. So what would be the next thing you would do? After that, maybe um, a popular language um, is, is JavaScript. So maybe you want to leave and offer a course a kid on, let's say, JavaScript. And so I have a course that I opened up as well. And here we go. Here's a JavaScript course. So again, this is our third language that I'm showing you or approach within the exact same software without me having to go change a computer. I'm in the same browser tab and I'm not really worried about operating systems and doing that. So as we all know, JavaScript is a very popular language typically for web and things along those lines. But it's very similar to some examples of, you know, it's very popular in language. So in this case, I'm looking at my notes to see what I want to show you next. So with JavaScript, let's do an example of um, some numeric and string expressions in JavaScript. Again, very common and popular topic. So again, same scenario, same system, same tool, same approach. Kids are very familiar with it. So in this case, this course leads with some very introduction, introductory language, just like I just mentioned, saying that, hey, you could choose between JavaScript, Python, and Java, but for the sake of this conversation, we're going to use JavaScript. So again, very similar. So with JavaScript, oftentimes you make a .js file, and in that .js file, you use the language, and you make some examples happen. And just like I showed you before with the um, case of Float, we're using the feature Codio where you're, it's doing real-time compilation and it's playing back your results um, directly in the inside of the, um, the output window. So here's some code that's written. It's taking an input from the command line. It's adding digit two together and multiplying by digit one and printing the result out. And so a student needs to be able to see these examples um, without having to start over or you know have to figure out how to set their machine up. So let's see how that works. If I run the code, you notice that it's happening right here in real time. The data is right there. And what's nice about it, again, digit two is six. So just to show you that this is, you know, not some kind of complicated or made up example, I multiply by two. If I run that, digit should become, it should update in real time. So you, you see the examples. I'm sorry, I did that incorrectly. Um, I'll do number equals two times digit two just to do something like that. Let's do that. There we go. So see numbers 12 now, two times digit two. So this is literally a real time compiler happening in the browser without you having to go and leave. And so this continues um, where you can check for errors. Um, you can build more complicated examples and um, build upon it. So again, very similar to what I showed you before. In this case, it's talking about the language language construct. So oftentimes you want to show people, you know, if semicolons are needed. That's a very thing that's very confusing as you kind of go from different languages, whether you're in the, the syntactical language of the language really helps you cause problems. So if you're going from JavaScript to Python to C sharp, whether you have to have a semicolon or not, or a case, if case matters becomes a big a big issue. Now I wanted to show this example because this is where the rubber kind of meets the, the road in that. Notice that I'm in a JavaScript course um, teaching JavaScript, but I was able to integrate an example of Float to walk them through a scenario. So this is a cool example in where you can walk a kid through or a student through their logic to figure out what they're looking to build to prove it out. And once they do that and get the Float piece going, you want them then to come and build a JavaScript equivalency. 
So this is how you can kind of start to bridge the gap. So, hey, guys, we just finished going through an example showing you flow charting and how flow charting can work. And then once the flow charting piece was done, we're going to go and pick our language of choice and have you write it in a, in a syntactical language. And then we're going to interleave these two together to help you understand these concepts. And if you have trouble with one versus the other, then you can log in and I'm sorry, you can you can toggle between the two to figure things out. And I think this is a very popular feature and a very popular approach because it helps you understand what's happening and it helps kids understand how to program and code uh, without really getting so stuck on a particular language. I often tell people that whether you're going from, you know, C sharp, Python, Java, Ruby, you name the language or, or of choice, they all are the same once you learn the syntax, but it's really more important to understand the process, the flow and the approach. So again, another example of having done this and gotten through this without having the concern. And so this is a really cool thing that's there and available. So again, continuing along this theme, I want to pick up another language to show you that again, it just keeps on giving. So another example that is very popular um, in this day and age is, is Python. Python is interesting because as we, this, I know a lot of conversations, if you've been in previous sessions and in, in the previous um, stage example, are people talking about data science and data sets. Um, Python is one of the leading languages for interacting with data. Um, and, and so if you're looking to teach things like machine learning or data processing or even plotting and graphing or regression, as you move into you know, middle and probably high school and beyond, um, Python is a very popular language for supporting you know, such initiatives. And again, just like the other examples that we've shown, this particular course is a course where we started with an example where the students were learning about, it was an Internet of Things course where each student was given an environmental sensor, which is a sensor that we manufacture that collects environmental data. So think of it as being a mini nest thermostat. So it measures things like light, temperature, humidity, pressure, um, all real time. And for this particular course, each student had to receive a, uh, a sensor. They had to collect data from that sensor and build their own data files and um, you know data over time. And then um, they had to use machine learning to build an anomaly detection algorithm. And so as a part of this course, they learn about Python, they learn about uh, machine learning, they learn how to apply that. So let's walk through the syllabus, and then I'll show some strategic examples. And so this particular machine, at the end of the day, I'm sorry, this course, they have to send data to a cloud network. And so to understand that, we have to, they have to understand Linux and how you get IP addresses and how commands work. And so in this first module, there is a very simple rudimentary, some examples of, hey, here's Linux. And Linux is an operating system that you can interact with on the command prompt. And what's nice about it is that if they run into a course, we come through just like before, and notice now I'm actually showing a Linux command prompt that they can interact with. Because remember, Codio is a virtual machine that sits on top of um, the browser that sits on top of that. So I can literally just work on a command prompt. So if I were to go here and issue a command, I don't know, ping google.com, I have full access to interacting you know, with that. So ping mantis edu.io. Oops. Uh, edu.io is there, right? I can do commands like dr. I can see my directory. I can uh, nano, nano um, test.ks, make a file, hello, control X, and save that. And then See my file there i can more so anything that you can think about that you would do it's all here and remember if you were teaching a language or you had a stack on here you wanted to learn how to compile from the command line all these things are available on top of this virtual machine and so in this particular course so they start with linux commands and how to make files and get them familiar with linux and then when they finish that they learn about um, our climate tag and how to save data from it. Then we went into some basic Python, like again, just like the other languages. And notice a the theme here, whether it's a Python course, or a JavaScript course, or you name it, what we're doing is that we're teaching the same fundamentals. You're gonna have variables and loops and conditions and have problems and deal with homework. 
And so let's go to an example here where this Python course, if I go through and click on, let's say looping as an example. So again, my third or fourth or fifth language in the presentation, same very consistent user experience. In this case, here's a Python course is bringing a library in. So again, it's NumPy's here, you have an array, you're gonna print out the array, you're gonna find a max of the array, and then you're gonna loop through and you're gonna print out values in the array if it's greater than six, right? Bam, let's run that and see. So I have an array, so let's walk back through it. I have an array, one through six, let's print out my array, our new array is, there we go. I wanna find the max of the array, the max of this array, the max element, um, I'm going to pick out the max element and then I'm going to go through and print out the number for greater than six. So again, all this is happening all in real time, which is really nice and interesting. Now, so they've gone through now, they've learned some basic Linux commands. They've learned about this climate sensor. They've gone through now and learned about Python. So we went through, think about what we're doing. Ultimately, they're going to take a sensor, collect data. Data is going to be in a CSV file. And that CSV file is going to be processed, and then it's going to be sent out to the cloud for graphing and charting. And so by the time they get through Linux, how to use a sensor, how to use Python to interact and load CSV data, they're in a really good spot. So next, now their CSV file is loaded, and now we have to go through and figure out ways to get them to build these learning models. And so as a part of this course, we actually um, taught them about unsupervised learning, and uh, unsupervised learning models and different approaches to process data using machine learning. And so there is an entire course in here that shows them and talks about isolation force and how they work, right? So this is again, a more advanced high school course. So they actually learn about isolation force. They actually build a model. So they load in their file, they build a machine learning model, they scale their model, they build a prediction algorithm and they output if an anomaly happened or not. So all of this is happening in real time in Codeo. So we teach about isolation for us as one approach. And then of course, also teach them about the local outlier factor, which is another approach. And once they do all of this, they then um, can run their program in real time, collect data and output if, they're, if their program had any kind of issue based on the machine learning model they trained in real time. All of this was done without them leaving their web browser. And then at the end, um, in this case, this particular course had a session where weather underground is a popular um, graph, what do you call it, graphing hobbyist website for people who are responsible for weather stations. And so we went through and pulled in weather data and showed them how to pull data from different websites online. So they pulled data from um, a website online and they went and ran data. Let's say they went and grabbed data for the previous year, I'm sorry, the previous month and they ran their anomaly detection algorithm against that data to detect weather patterns. And in another case of the stretch goal, they also use that same data to send it to a third party network using web services. So again, very much more complicated example, uh, leaning toward high school and potentially college. Um, but again, very important, very interesting, and something that can go um, you know, in an interesting way across the board. And to go back to other examples, um, so now we've shown JavaScript, we've shown Python, we've shown code, we've shown Float. And the last thing that I will show, um, again, other people like to teach, um, again, C++. <laughs> so again, here's a C++, um, actually I'm not in that course. Let me go and grab a new course. So I'll go to um, resources and I'll go search for a um, make sure I'm Go find, I don't have this course installed, so this would be a good time to show an example. Um, let's go to resources. And let's take this introduction to C. Add to my account. So I have a course called Introduction to C++. I just simply go add to my account. So I want to teach this C++ course. I want to add it to my Codeo account. By simply picking that button, I can give it a name, Introduction to C++, and I'll call it, um, if I can find it, <laughs> and I'll put it in my right organization and hit um, a leading trail. Sorry, got to get rid of that. 
at my course and I'll create, I did something wrong, sorry. Don't know what just happened. Live demos always get you. Let's do this again. I'll hit this guy, hit add to my account. And let's try this again. Add it in here. I put a T in front of it. Hit create course. So now, notice, without doing any work, I've gone through now, add an entire course to my program. And just like everything else I've done now, um, due to magic of partners like Codio and other people who publish these great courses, I'm in my classroom and I'm able to teach a course without having to do any work that I can modify. So in this case, um, try it. Nope. Command executed okay. And they simply wanted me to go here and try to put in a C out statement, write it here and go try it. And oops, got a bug. So what did I do wrong? I haven't written C++ in a long time. <laughs> so add a code block. So the, this is copy and paste the code and text. Make sure the code's between the add code. Oh, they want you to put a space, I believe. And then try it. All right, I did something wrong. But you get the point. Oh, I think I'm missing a semicolon in C sharp. There we go. Oh, see? I haven't coded in C sharp since I was in college, but I do remember semicolons are needed. But an entirely new language, bringing in a main space, bringing in idlestream.h, running this. I do recall that when I was in graduate school or undergraduate, finding the right libraries and trying to run code in this space was a very complicated and te te um, teeter um, onerous thing. And so this is all available and, you know, right here in front of us. And so um, just to kind of wrap things up, so Codio, as you're thinking about ways to bring coding into your school, your district, your classroom, your after school program, Codio is a very turnkey way to make this happen. Um, it takes the onus out of you as a teacher, from thinking about infrastructural things, um, if things are gonna work in the environments the students are gonna have. Whether you're teaching or using the, um, the platform in person, and or in a remote environment, such as those that we've been exposed to as a result of COVID. Um, it works in both scenarios. If you're an organization, if you're if you're a principal or somebody responsible for infrastructure, a platform such as Codio can really, really save you a bunch of time and money because you're not having a, you're not forced to go buy the latest computers or maintain computer labs or have it to where you're restricted on who can teach in what scenarios. I've oftentimes been responsible for running um, summer camps or experiences or after school programs where when we're you have to spend the entire day trying to get computers configured for what you're trying to go and teach so this really makes everything really turnkey from a cost perspective Todio is very 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 um, affordable um, the cost so as little as ten dollars a student a year and there are no teacher costs at all for the platform and so that that's the pricing for k-12 and so as you can imagine that pro that number scales very well and there are no minimal, so you don't have to sign up an entire school or an entire district. It really is an a la carte framework that you could put together that would scale based on the organization that you're supporting. Within Codio, all of the examples that I showed, um, as you have access to the platform, any resource um, that's available from the resources tab, those sample courses that I showed here, um, there's a wealth of library of courses that are available. And again, I only showed a few, but Again, SQL's in here. There are examples. Um, there are other languages. CSS is popular as well. So all of these courses that are available um, to be added to your platform, there's no additional charge for things that are publicly available. And so you can really find some cool ways to add content and have a starter pack without supporting that or having concerns. From Mantis CDU, we do have a couple of um, packs that we've added on top of the platform that go deeper. And so we offer a few specialty courses that go deeper into what's being supported um, on top of Codio. And that helps us then um, if you're looking to have specialties for things like in our case, we focus on the, the machine learning examples as applied to physical computing. Uh, we have schools and partners that are working on scenarios around aquaponics and hydroponics. And so those hands on deep examples that run a lot more deep, um, we tend to build those out and we have very good pricing and support to support those, those as well. Um, so with that, I would like to, if there are any questions, I want to find a way to open the floor for questions if, if any are available. 
I don't know who's in the in the room, but if you have any questions, um, you can please put those in the chat, and I can try to address those questions, um, and go from there. Any? Okay, I think I hit the cost. So the cost is ten dollars a student a year, um, with no minimums uh, for, for the Codeo platform, and with no cost for teachers. Okay. I don't see any other questions in the chat, either. Um, but that was very, very effective. Like I've already sent an email to <laughs> try to get that that video in front of some folks, and um, particularly yeah. Cedric and that 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 crew. Um, yeah. But yeah, uh, looks good. I'm trying to figure out ways to. To roll into that, I know that cost is going to be a, a factor for some schools and thinking about ways to mitigate that from the state level. Yeah. Um, I'm, excited, like, I'm excited about the platform. Um, it, it really, if you have ever tried to write code before and do stuff like the ease and how it works, I think it, I can, like we talked about some things we've been excited about in the past. Imagine us building these curriculum packs and examples that are already there and you just know it works from the beginning. It'll save so much pain for teachers to kind of get in there. And so they have done a lot of amazing work. Codio is um, on the post-secondary side. So you can imagine a lot of colleges love what they're doing. And so we partnered with Codio to be um, a partner for K-12 because I, I know this need is needed in the K-12 side. And so now that we have this integration working, all the work that I've shown you in the past, we've now built integrations directly within Codio for all of our sensors, all of our solutions. And so we have a way to scale that now versus before. If I would go to an event, Hey, Brian, how many laptops you have? Can I get access 10 minutes earlier so I can go and try to install this framework on it? And you go crazy trying to do those things. So this this makes life so much easier to scale and repeat as well. I understand. I agree. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, I think I think we're pretty good. Um, okay, that's cool. Yeah, I, like I said, it's, go through it. It's, um, it's there. But thank you for the opportunity, man. I hope, hope people get to see this. I'm excited by it. And um. Thank you guys again for the opportunity to, to present the work that we're doing. No problem. Thank you. Uh, the pre presentation went very smooth, like it's well packaged. You, I can tell you polished that. <laughs> I appreciate it, man. Thank you. That's coming from you, man. That's, that's well received. Man. I do appreciate it. All right. Thank you. Have a good one. All right, you too.